Hello and welcome to Explaining Rust Analyzer, a video series where we try to understand how Rust Analyzer works once we st once a system at a time. So uh, last time uh, we took our last look uh, for the time being at the Rowan crate, the crate which implements syntax tree for Rust. Today we will start looking into the parser, the bit of code in Rust Analyzer which turns an input text into actual syntax tree. So uh, let's get started. Let's go to the Rust analyzer and switch the master branch and open this code. So the parser, unsurprisingly, too many crates. Wait a minute, crates. Uh, yeah, the parser unsurprisingly lives in the parser crate. One interesting point uh, you may immediately note is that this crate doesn't actually depend on row one. In fact, it doesn't depend on anything at all. There is like this just utility crate for some specific asserts. And that is one of the main design decisions and design goals of this library to make it independent on a particular syntax tree implementation. And I think it is pretty successful in this sense. I really like how the interface of this parser is very, very narrow. That's exactly what I was describing about Rowan library is that we have this complicated implementation, but a relatively simple interface for syntax trees. The same happens with uh, the parser. The interface is even like simpler than that of the raw one. Like there is like 150 lines here, and it's like not an interface. Like most of the lines actually is parser implementation. So uh, let's look what we have here. Let's start with the parser file function, which is the, the main entry point. Well, not the main entry point, but like a good thing to look first. Uh, you notice that it like doesn't like Typically, when you look at the parse function, you would expect it to take a text or a vector of tokens and return a syntax tree. Uh, that's not the case for Rustalizer. Uh, the parser takes two arguments and returns nothing, and the arguments are token source and tree sync. So why is that set up that way? Well. Uh, as I've said, the goal here is to make parser as usable as possible. We want to abstract it away, both from the source of tokens, because we want to uh, produce syntax tree either from the text or from tokens emitted by macros, maybe procedural macros. And we also uh, want uh, to abstract it from the syntax tree, uh, because just the implementation of the raw one constantly evolves in Rust Analyzer, and also because I hope that one day we will be able to produce two syntax trees out of this parser. Uh, the raw one syntax tree and also the, the IST used by the Rust compiler itself, such that we can actually use a parser. So um, uh, let's uh, look what we have here. First, token source. Uh, it is basically an iterator of tokens with some extra methods. So you have a token source. You can look at the current token and you can advance to the next token. Uh, you can also like look at the uh, several next tokens like arbitrary n, but actually at the runtime this n is capped at three. So like this could be equivalently expressed as look ahead first, second, and third. And finally, uh, you can check if a token is a specific keyword. Uh, we need this because the token doesn't contain its text. It contains only the kind of a token. And there are certain uh, keywords in Rust which are contextual. So for example, mm, I don't know what, what would be, yeah. So we can have in like when we talk about specialization we can have default methods and here default is 
and textual keyboard, but it also can be a usual identifier, as for example, in the default method of the default trait. That's actually uh, interesting, like language design questions. Should you even admit contextual keywords, or maybe all of your keywords should be contextual because uh, it kind of like like this split into like real hard keywords and soft or contextual keywords feels a little bit weird, and it also feels uh, a little bit weird than keywords actually subtract from the set of identifiers. Uh, which you would like to use because, like, for example, like default is a reasonable keyword, but also it's really great that we have this default name, uh, name, or for example, uh, if we say about like hash set, hash set has a union method, and it's also like really great that we can just like name this method union, and that, for example, if we declare union u, it doesn't clash with the name of the method. So, anyway, uh Bottom line is that we need to distinguish contextual keywords, and as we do not directly store the text of the tokens, we just add this uh, special case method to the token source. And yeah, uh, the token uh, contains just a syntax kind. It doesn't contain positional information, it doesn't contain text. If needed, that can be tracked separately by the token source, but this isn't something parser looks at and isn't something parser can make decisions uh, based on. Okay, uh, the syntax kind, I think we've covered syntax kind previously. It's just an anom of all possible syntax tokens and actual, well, an anom of all possible tokens as well as an anom of all possible intermediate trees. So if we... look at uh, some syntax tree. So for example, identifier is a syntax kind for a token, but name ref, path segment, path, meta, utter would all be syntax kind for actual nodes. Uh, one interesting uh, point here, uh, I'm not sure if we will be covering this uh, in this lecture uh, in depth or not, is that like tokens in Rust are actually hard. And typing is also hard. Yeah, so uh, if you look at something like this, uh, it's unclear if these uh, two uh, greater signs are a single token or, or two tokens. And actually when the lecture produces tokens, it doesn't uh, doesn't know where they should be glued or not. And by the way, okay, so, so kind of like, this is the case where they shouldn't be, uh, they should be glued, but in, for example, option of vector like uh, these are like two separate tokens you actually can see this in the syntax tree so here we see show syntax tree and we see that this is just a single token shift right and here actually i, I wonder if this works i wonder if this is that address syntax because it, it might be valid. So uh, let's check. Oh, this works. Okay, yeah. Uh, luckily, this doesn't work. Uh, you actually need. Not just to verify that it doesn't work in any position. Okay, yeah, right. Uh, it's uh, anyway, it's like some, some dark corner for us grammar. This could have worked. Anyway, um, I wonder then why we don't mean to syntax error here because it seems like we should be telling that something is wrong here. So, uh, turn back to this. Uh, this second is a single shift right here. We will see that there are like separate right angle tokens, and they even belong to different levels of the syntax tree. So uh, the lexer only emits atomic tokens, 
And uh, atomic tokens may have a flag signifying that the atomic token is actually joined to the next token. And the parser then can either emit two separate tokens or actually glue two lexer tokens uh, into a parser token. And that's an important, an important bit of information. Uh, the tokens you get in the syntax tree are not necessarily the same tokens which uh, the lexer gave you. The parser might glue uh, lexer tokens uh, together. It can actually sometimes split uh, one lexer token into two, but I don't think we have this implemented yet. Uh, okay. So again, like the interface for token source is stupidly simple. Uh, there's like nothing, nothing uh, complicated here. Uh, there is like no any kind of libraries. Like the only hard thing is like syntax kind, but conceptually this is just like U16, just a number signifying the token. Uh, and this interface uh, the parser uses to get, well, tokens from the underlying token source, basically. To iterate the tokens, parser repeatedly calls bump and current. TreeSync is the opposite uh, side. Uh, TreeSync is the interface parser uses to produce a syntax tree. And it's like just stupidly simple. Like if you look at uh, some traditional compiler, IST, it has like a ton of factory methods, a huge API surface for construct syntax tree. Uh, for our use case, because we use those untyped syntax tree underneath, the API to construct syntax tree is just these four methods, which are not complicated at all. So uh, the idea is that you sort of traverse the syntax tree. And as you're traversing the syntax tree in the natural order, you just say loud, uh, what are you seeing in the tree? So. Uh, you say, hey, start a node. Uh, actually, should probably be spelled like this, like to make this more natural. So you first start the node, then you emit some tokens, and then you finish a node. And of course, uh, nodes can be nested. So you can start node, emit a token, then start another node, then emit a couple of more tokens, then finish the first node, then emit one more token, and then finish the last node. So there is an invariant that start and finish calls should be paired and yeah that actually means that they should be together it's yeah it's it's it's, it's hard yeah I, I guess i guess this would probably be the best way to spell this because actually you cannot emit a token which isn't a child of a node anyway uh doesn't matter uh, the idea is that you just like describe uh the tree by traversal and the description contains uh only like when you enter a node, you just specify the kind of a node. When you exit a node, you don't say anything because it is clear uh, which start node is closed because it should be just a sequence of balance parentheses. When you emit a token, uh, you say the kind of a token and the amount of a tokens you consume from the token source. So uh, it's important to realize that token source and tree sync are not can are not synchronized automatically. So you can uh, bump here, and it doesn't necessarily produce a token here. Uh, similarly, you can emit a token here, you can call a token here, but it doesn't translate into a bump. But they should be logically synchronized in a way, uh, in a sense that the caller which which uh, gives you tree sync and token source assumes that, hey, like the tokens you actually push into tracing come from this token source. Uh, but we uh, don't actually transfer the actual token data structure. And that's why uh, we can simplify the interface uh, quite a bit. Basically, uh, the color of the API can have arbitrary complex data structures uh, back in uh, this, uh, back in this uh, thing. Uh, but as we only have like those implicit indices in the stream of tokens, uh, uh, we, we don't have to make this our interface generic of those data structures. Anyway, uh, second argument here is like the amount of tokens you want to consume. And that's like exactly for that uh, use case I described. So if this is a single token, 
the parser will call token using uh, this as a syntax kind. So like this. And if these are two separate tokens, then it will call something like this. Yeah, by the way, uh, I don't think we've covered T macro yet. That's actually an interesting thing. So, syntax kind is an enum, and it has kind of like a lot of names in it, and it is. Uh, really unergonomic to use names to refer to punctuation because like i don't know something like uh dot to ik it's like not really easy to grasp that this is actually this token so that's why we have this um i wonder if i can make this better yeah. okay yeah uh, not sure how i did it but i managed to reformat this uh, in a better way yeah anyway uh, what this macro does is that it uh, transfers from the depiction of a token to an actual symbolic uh, name of syntax kinds. Anyway, uh, where are we? Yeah, so uh, this thing will emit a single token with two lexer tokens, and this thing will emit uh two separate tokens finally there is also interface for emitting errors and parser errors in rust analyzer are horrible they're very very basic very very bare bones and it's just a string without any kind of position information uh, it would actually be a great challenge to make this compatible with a rich Rust C style syntax diagnostics because we want we do want to uh, add more stuff than just like a string. Uh, but uh, this hasn't been a too a big of a priority for us uh, because uh, like when you write an ID, you don't actually care about parser errors that much. So if you are type something like this, you like. The biggest help you can uh, provide to the user is to flag this error immediately. So like I type put and I see that, hey, this is underlined with red wavy underline and it isn't highlighted like a proper keyword. So I must have made it a poor and I check it and uh, like I immediately get feedback from highlighting that it's better. And then like I type something and it's correct and actually that's like that's that is a backend display because we should be underlining like the position after the struct because the struct itself is correct. So if we type something like this, we see where the errors are. Yeah, uh, yeah. So let me actually try to like not show this but explain it. Uh, the idea here is that you if you immediately show the error to the user and you also correctly uh, specify the error when the when uh, the position where the error happens, when as soon as user types something wrong, they immediately get the feedback. You don't actually need the super good error message. It would be nice, but it's not required because like this direct feedback gives better, uh, well, this direct feedback gives feedback to the user and they can just fix their syntax errors by trying another syntax immediately without hitting uh, recompile and all that stuff. I guess, yeah. I guess like on a meta level, uh, if you have very fast feedback loop for error reporting, you don't care about explaining in detail 
what the problem is because rather because there are two workflows one workflow is that you type something you read the error message you understand how you need to fix it and you apply the fix the other approach is you type something it doesn't work you type something else and if you uh, can try this type something else with a very very uh, fast turnaround time then well you don't need to have good error messages for simple cases and parser errors are usually simple it's not to say that like they use useless we should uh, we should add them and we will definitely add them once we merge the work together with rasi it's just that it hasn't been a priority so it's like very very simplistic error type here uh okay and that's it uh that's uh, the whole interface for the parser and uh, you just like give a thing uh, give a source of tokens give a sync of trees and the parser drives the tree sync uh, sort of drawing the tree data structure and then you can construct the actual tree on the other side of this tree sync if you remember the green uh, node builder we looked at a draw one it's pretty clear how it transforms to the things actually uh, we can just look at it let's open syntax sweep and do we have Mm, I guess. Yeah, so syntax tree builder just wraps green node builder, and uh, in green node we have the separation start node, finish node, and token, and they exactly correspond to start node, finish node, and token operations we have. Interesting. Well, the difference is that here uh, we need to know the actual text of a token, and here we deliberately do not give access to the text of a token. But uh, when you implement the tree sync, you actually can track what uh, the text of a current token is. So you can set this information, and actually, if we look at this syntax tree builder. Where are we calling it? Go to definition. Why are you not working? Okay, yeah. So uh, here we have uh, the text of the whole file, our syntax tree builder, and when we eat a token with a specified number of tokens, we figure out what's the range of a text, and we figure out the text, and then we call this uh, green builder's token method. So yeah, that's like uh, the, the core idea of interface. We want to allow the other side of a tree sync to vary to provide arbitrary uh, syntax trees. Uh, finally, uh, this parse source tree uh, source file is just one entry point of a parser, which parses the whole file. But you can also uh, ask the parser to parse some specific syntax contracts, uh, constructs like a path, an expression, a statement, a pattern. Uh, and uh, that's uh, mostly useful for macros. So if you have macro rules and it has something like arg expert then entry point expert will be used to actually parse those arguments okay um, so uh, now that we look at the interface let's actually start looking at the implementation well first of all uh, there's like this utility method token set uh, it's useful uh, when you write a parser to check if a particular token is a part of a specific set of tokens. And of course, uh, you want to use bit set to implement the tokens. And uh, that's uh, what it is. Uh, just a bit set implemented is uh, U128 because we uh, don't have more than 100 a a tokens. And it's pretty similar. And it's, it's, it's kind of like a... I have fond memories of this token set module because it evolved as Rust itself evolved. Because originally it was spelled like this because we didn't have 
uh, U128 type and it also was implemented via macros because we didn't have cons generics but then at some point we added cons generics uh, well then at some point we added this like uh, 128 uh, bit type and then we added cons generics and now it's like very very nice uh, very good looking module Oh, right. Uh, like, I think the last bit was then, uh, so kind of like, uh, we added union and contains relatively early because very simple, but adding this uh, new function took some more Rust versions because here we need to actually loop over the uh, list. Uh, okay. And now, uh, yeah. Now uh, for the fun part, the event module. Uh, this module is kind of like relatively short, uh, like uh, 130 lines, and it consists mostly of the comments, and it just explains a very very interesting, a very interesting bit about how parser works. So it. It will take some time to grok. I recommend you opening this file and read the implementation and the comments more carefully after this video. But here, let me try to explain what uh, this is doing. So, uh, if you look at the tracing, uh, you see that it describes the natural uh, walk of the syntax tree. So we go uh, in the root, and then we go with first child, and the first child of the first child, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we come back and go to the next child. So like, the very easy, very natural approach to describe the trees. The problem is that when you parse certain uh, syntactic constructs, uh, the tree looks a slightly different uh, than what you would uh, want. So. To give a simple example, oh well, uh, no, like no, uh, that's not a simple example. It's actually a hard example, but that's like a motivational example. So here we have uh, one times two. Yeah, uh, let, let, let me do this. Like one times two plus three. So uh, what nodes do we have here? We have one times two. And we have like the whole one times two plus three. So this is not a syntax node. If I add parentheses, I would get like uh, something like this. The problem here, though, and yeah, when we feed this thing into the tree sync, we want to say that hey, we entered addition, and only then we entered multiplication. The problem uh, here is that. When the parser parses this, it actually reads the text from left to right. So uh, by the time it read, uh, so when it has read one times, it doesn't yet know that there will be a plus there. And uh, once it read one times two, it knows that, hey, like one times two will be a node in the resultant syntax tree. But it doesn't yet know that, hey, there is like this plus three ahead of us. And when you write a parser, it's convenient to emit the syntax tree not in the actual final shape, but uh, just um, in the order you actually recognize syntax node. So uh, in uh, yeah. In tracing, we uh, want to see addition, then multiplication. In parser, we want to actually say exactly the opposite. We want to say, hey, I saw multiplication, then I saw addition, and then we kind of like want to apply fix up. We want to say, hey, this addition should actually start before multiplication. And uh, this is what this event module allows us to do. So this is a primitive implementation of parser, and it allows us to bridge convenient control flow in the parser to the shape of a tree we want to produce. 
Oh my, it's... That's <laughs> that's that was like a really like uh, I, I'm live on at like this extend selection uh, line from the commit message on the play on this line because it's like yeah it's 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 phone memories like this extend selection is like this functionality when you can extend selection to bigger and bigger syntactic constructs and like uh, shrink it and it's like the first ID feature you have when you have a working parser. And like, indeed you see like this uh, party emoji here and it was indeed kind of like a great thing that it actually worked. And yeah, we've went a long road in this three years. Like, I, I, I can't believe that like we did extend selections only three years ago and like now we have like type inference, proc macros and like whatnot. So yeah, like let's stop being sentimental and actually uh, get back to how you do this. So. Uh, we want to sync our trees into tree sync, but what the parser is producing is it produces a sequence of event. And event actually is uh, the same uh, start finish error thing like the one in the tree sync. It's just the order is different. So uh, like, let's look at the simple parts. We have start with syntax kind, we have finish, we have token with kind and number of tokens, and we have error. And that is exactly like the TreeSync interface. The only thing that's different is that we have this forward parent uh, in the start. And what this forward parent means is that although like we say that this is a start event, uh, this node isn't actually a child of the last node, which is currently, uh, which is like the current parent. But Trava, this node is a child of some future node, which uh, is situated forward parent elements uh, forward. So uh, it would be useful to take a look at this picture. Uh, it talks about this syntax. Again, so uh, here, like if we use extend selection, yeah, that's not that's not really helpful. I need uh, three segments here. So here, if we use extend selection, uh, you will notice that this is the nested structure we have here. So this is not a list of segments; rather, it is a nested tree, where the bus segment has full bar as a parent. And the bar segment has foo as a parent. So if we invoke extend selection here, we will uh, just select the whole node. And here we will just uh, we will follow the true structure. And this is visible in show syntax tree. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's too bad we don't have syntax highlighting here. So. Uh, the outer path contains of bar and the inner path, which is foo and a colon. But again, when we parse this thing, so uh, in terms of tree sync, the first, we first start the bar path, and then we start the foo path, and then we end the foo path, and then we end the bar path. But in terms of uh, what we see in the parser while we are parsing the code is exactly the opposite. We first a start and finish foo, and then we start and finish bar. And uh, let's look at how this is implemented. Okay. So uh, what the parser will emit for this code is that it will say, hey, start path, then it will emit identifier foo, and then it will emit finish path. But, uh, yeah, it, finish path, and then it will start the next path, uh, and uh, it, like the double colon, the identifier, and that will finish path. But the forward parent of this start path will be pointing to this, to this next start path. So that means semantically 
that so this is i think yeah uh yep yeah, so uh it's kind of using picture uh so uh that semantically means that we first start this like whole path and then we start the sub path yeah it's uh, it's it's very confusing. Uh, I, I, I don't really hope to understand to like explain this in a reasonable way because yeah, I'm kind of like I, I I wrote this code once, and every time I need to like look into it, I just don't understand what's going on without like really thinking like for half an hour about like this uh, type definition and this loop. But like that's the, the rough idea how it works. I guess like the useful thing is like this uh okay yeah before i say that uh before we continue looking into process function uh, i want to say that we also have this magical syntax kind here which is called tombstone and uh what this means is that the parser may emit a start event and then change its mind and say, hey, kind of like completely ignore the start event. Uh, and um, uh, it can do this by uh, saying that the kind of this path is actually a tombstone. So uh, let's now look at the process function. Uh, like um, Again, like well, one good thing here is that, again, this module is completely self-contained and we don't need to understand the parser to understand how uh, this works. It's just like the reshaping of the trees. So what the process uh, function does, it takes a tree sync, it, uh, it takes a vector of events, which uh, describe, which describe the tree, but in a slightly different shape and just reshapes events to produce the shape we want to have in a tree sync. And that's easy. So uh, we iterate through all of the events and we actually will be like mutating them in place. So that's why we have like, not just a for loop, but it's like being replaced. And I actually don't remember why are we, okay, yes. Now I think I remember why we are mutating uh, events anyway. So yeah, we iterate through events. Uh, if the current event is a tombstone, we just ignore it. Uh, if uh, the current event is start, and uh, let's assume that forward parent is uh, none for the time being. So that means that we will uh, completely ignore this block. So if forward parent is none, what we are doing here is that we're pushing uh, the kind forward parents and then we like drain forward parents in the reverse order, but there is like only one element uh, there. Uh, so we just call start node. So I guess uh, like the equivalent way to say this is that if forward parent is none, then just start the node. Else, blah blah blah. But uh, it turns out that like the non none case for forward parent works out naturally, so there is no this condition here. Uh, actually, uh, I wonder if adding this condition would actually speed the thing up because I think it like potentially can because like uh, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, that can be optimizable. Uh, anyway, so if the board parent is not none, uh, what we will do here is that we will follow the chain of forward parents. Because, so if uh, the not x, and it has forward parent, it parent points to the not y. The not y itself might have a forward parent pointing to the not x. So uh, if we have something like this, x, y, z, x, y, z, and x points to y via forward parent, and y points to z via forward parent, we actually want to say start z, then start y, then start x, rather than start x, start y, start z. So uh, when we hit a node with forward parent, 
we actually should start not a forward parent, but kind of like the recursive forward parent. And that's what is happening here. Oh god, I've, I think I, I'm even understanding this code. That's, that's surprising. Uh, last time it took much more time for me to, to grok it. Uh, probably someone, probably not me, added comments here, which made it uh, better. Okay. So uh, we start uh, like. Uh, we want to form a chain of forward parents. Initially, this chain contains just uh, of ourselves. Uh, we take forward parent, and while we have forward parent, uh, we replace that forward parent with tombstone, because again, we are going to start with forward parent now. So we don't actually... Uh, we want to kind of like squash that node in in the future we want to remove it uh removing it from a vector would be time consuming so we just replace it with a tombstone okay so uh we take this uh element if it itself oh my god so is this, is this even possible like can we have tombstones in the forward parent chain and it I wonder if we just comment this out and run the tests. Would anything break? Yeah, anyway, so uh, this bit of code I don't understand. Yeah, and as the parser uh yeah, yeah, uh, it probably is important. Uh, I need to figure out why. It's like, uh, I, I'm surprised that we have this if here, but anyway, we have this if here. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently, the chain of forward parents can actually span tombstones. Well, yeah, I guess it sort of makes sense. Uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, basically, what we are doing here is that we just like loop through all the forward parents. And yeah, forward parents are relative indexes, so we have to accumulate them, uh, this here, and collect all the forward parents into this forward parent vector. And uh, I guess it would be clearer to say something like forward parents dot, uh, dot clear, uh, because like we just catch this. It's it's like uh, this is outside of the loop, not because we uh, want to reuse it, not because we want to accumulate forward parents it we actually could have said this it's just that uh i want to reuse this vector so uh we accumulate uh the list of forward parents then we just remove all of the parents in the reverse order and start them and rest is easy uh if we finish uh the node we just finish the node uh, if we uh, should emit some tokens, we emit some tokens, and if we should emit an error, we emit an error. Uh, okay, I guess that's probably a good place to pause for us. Like we haven't uh, looked at the actual parser and the actual grammar and all the hard bits, but uh, we covered like the main idea behind this parser module. Uh, actually, two main ideas. The first main idea is that we want to keep this independent of a particular syntax tree implementation. And that's why we have this uh, token source and tree sync set up. And the second idea is that when you parse thing, things, you want your consumer to have this nicely shaped syntax tree in a nice natural traversal order. But when you actually parse, the syntax, uh, you traverse the nodes not in this natural order, but rather in the order they are written in the source text. And that order might be different for binary expressions, for path, and for other uh, recursive things. Basically, uh, that's uh, like th that's exactly uh, how the problem of left recursion manifests itself uh, in this parser. Like, anyway, you have kind of like left recursion looking like a rule in the grammar you would have like this uh effect that the tree as produced by parser doesn't match the tree as expected by the user 
Anyway, we have a bit of code in the event module which explicitly brings those two representations. The event module is effectively a tree, a tree traversal, but in the uh, in the order convenient for the parser. And the process function takes this convenient for parser order and uh, transforms it to the actual order we want to see in the consumers of the API. Uh, again, that's, I don't know. I, I, I really like both like this whole setup of a parser, which I managed to provide really clean and really small interface. It's 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 it's, it's really amazing that Rustalizer like production project it has been uh, developed for like three years at least, uh, and like this is like the core of a system, and it is so simple. So that's that's a great. We struck the right the right abstraction here. So that's like one part of why I love this code. The other part is that, like, <laughs> this loop is like really complicated. It's like it's a kind of like real like stack and link lists and like algorithmic manipulation, not something you see in you know, like typical day-to-day -day programming where you just like concatenate strings around and pass context uh, through uh, ten levels of uh, function calls. But anyway, that's kind of like nice code. It's that's. It does the thing, it takes some time to wrap your head around it, but you realize that, hey, this, in some sense, pretty elegant. Although I must say, I still don't understand why we exactly need this uh, tombstone condition here. Okay, so, uh, and let's kind of like leave on this cliffhanger today uh, so that we can uh, discuss the actual parsing process and the actual grammar next time. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.